Hey everyone and welcome to the Atomic Cinema Experiment. I am Peter and I'm joined as always by my very slightly annoyed co-host Tara. Greetings citizens. Yes, welcome. Welcome to the show. How are you Tara? How's, how's, your, how's your week been? Yeah, alright. Oh, how's yours? <laughs> Well, no, I wasn't waiting for you to ask me. Um, although it was fine, for, for the record. It was very busy. Um, just, um, I don't know, I, I I was expecting more of an elaboration than, uh, yeah, all right, silence. <laughs> it's great for radio. It's just the, the quick, no-nonsense answer with no, no details or uh, fluff or personality of any kind. I mean, that's, that's why you hired me, right? <laughs> Because you're no nonsense, yes, quite, quite right, <laughs> quite right. Um, yes, yeah, so we're really talking about sci-fi movies on this show, and coming up on this week's show, we are going to be talking about Fast Color, which is a movie that came out this year. It's listed as 2018 because it was at some festivals last year, but it did come out this year. So, um, I'm not sure if we're going to do like a top ten of the year um, on the Ace. We haven't really thought about it. But it depends if there's enough to do a top. 10. You mean of like 2019? Of 2019, yeah. Like when we get to the end of the year, because we do it in the streams, but I don't, I don't know if there's enough sci-fi movies in the year. There probably is. Uh, I don't know. We watch a lot of old stuff, so enough good even ones. Even if there is, I don't know if we yeah. even review ten. <laughs> I think we will have. I, I think we'll review ten, but but you know, one of them will be Captive State, <laughs> for example. <laughs> so like, I don't know if it's going to be ten good ones. Is is the is the thing? Um, right. Me, me and Tim do churn through a few more episodes in comparison to the to this show, mm -hmm. so um, I don't know. We'll we'll have a look at the end of the year and see how how it goes. Um, although it does give us an obvious countdown to do sometime early next year, because I don't know if you noticed, Tara, but this is the final year of the decade, which means a top list of the decade is very much on the horizon. Oh, okay. Yeah, we probably have enough for that. Mm. There's been some really good sci-fi this decade. There has been some really good sci-fi. There was a really good sci-fi like that last decade as well. I, I remember like like 2009, the last year, last decade, like hit us with like Moon and District Nine and. Um, yeah, that's true. So for this day decade, we have like Arrival, Mad Max, and Fury Road, Ex Machina. Ex Machina, there you go. I really liked Annihilation. No, it wasn't for everybody, but I really liked it. I liked it as well. Um, so now a lot of good movies. So something we might do but hey uh anyway i got into that because we were talking about that i was i was basically just saying if we do a top 10 of 2019 this will be eligible for it uh because it's it's counted 2019 as far as i'm concerned um well, we shall see if it makes the list <laughs> oh i wonder what that that tone meant oh <laughs> i don't want to make too many predictions because i've been wrong before if i had mentioned in captive state uh, not captive state sorry captive state we were on the same page in captive state it was alita alita was the one that i yeah, that was a fun movie. <laughs> also mispre mispredicted. Uh, 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 uh. I liked it. Uh. I could watch two or three more of those. <laughs> don't think I will because I don't think it made any money. So. Yeah, I mean, if they make a second one, I'll review it. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not jumping at the bit. Or chomping we got. At the bit. I mean, it ended on a cliffhanger. <laughs> we didn't even get to see what Elysium looked like. I can live with that. What about the big reveal at the end on who the true villain is? <sighs> That's all I've got I need to, to know more about the brain with the eyeballs inside the box. The fish tank box. I need you mean to know crying more. from Dimension X? <laughs> no. Not the Ninja Turtle guy. <laughs> yeah, no, crying from dementia. The so, now, see if they add the, the, the you know Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello, and Michelangelo in the next movie, then I'll be on board. Then I'll be like, yeah, okay, <laughs> there's a Turtles movie, and I'll I can guest star, sure. Yeah, those have been real good, right? Recently, no. Okay, fine. Like Michael Bay got his grubby little mitts on it, and that it all went to shit. But there's some good Turtles in the back catalog. That that 1990 movie holds up. I'm saying it. Sam Rockwell's yeah, in it. Yeah, one that. of them has Sam Rockwell in it. Yeah, there you go. See, Sam Rockwell. Although I don't think it's a very good one. No, no, it is. It's the first one. It's great. Oh, he is in the first one? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's really good. That's where he got his career started. Exactly. He, he would be nothing without the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Thank you, Turtles. Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh dear. Anyway, uh, so yeah, fast colors. What we're going to talk about. We'll start off spoiler free as we always do. We'll give you a warning in the middle before we go into spoilers. And uh, if Tara can not tangent me for the next couple of minutes, I will give you the basic premise of the film. That's what I'm here for. It's, it's your fault. Uh, Ninety nine times out of a hundred, it's your fault. We're tangent. Zero enthusiasm and full tangents. <laughs> So, Fast Color is is a kind of low low fi science fiction movie, and by that I mean it's not like you know in your face with the sci fi. It's not like big concepts. Well, it's big concepts, but it's not big visuals or anything like that for the most part. It's a, a family drama, but happens to be a little bit sci fi, where uh, we have these three generations of this one family. Uh, the main character Ruth, p- played by Gugu Mbatha Raw, uh, which is a fantastic name. You may know her from uh, the San Junipero episode of Black Mirror. You might know her from the Cloverfield Paradox, uh, and she was in a few other trailers that I saw last year. She she popped up in quite a lot of things recently. She was in San Junipero. Yeah, she was the the main one of the two main girls. No, that wasn't her. That was her. I'm <laughs> looking it up right now. You look it up. You flat out told me I was wrong before and I've been proven right. I'm more than happy for you to go and corroborate my story. Um, so she's here and I, you got um, David Stratham's in there as well. Uh, you got the, the older uh, of the generations, which is Bo, which is uh, Ruth's mother. And oh, then it you... is her. She looks so different in 80s makeup. What's, what's that I heard? What was that? Peter, you're right. Okay, there's no need to gloat, <laughs> all right? <laughs> There's every need. Uh, and then the little girl uh, Lila is the is uh, Ruth's daughter. So we got these generations of, of of these this family, and uh, they all have to some extent superpowers. Um, and they're somewhat related. They're not like males apart from each other. Although Ruth's is a little bit different from her mother and her daughters, where she has these seizures that cause like earthquakes. Essentially, she essentially shakes the earth um, with her power uncontrollably. So. Uh, she's on the run uh, from being chased and she comes back home and tries to hide out and over the course of the film it's kind of about trying to like control her power and har- harness it and reconnect with her daughter and that's that's all I'll say in spoiler free so this is the point where I ask the question uh, for Tara who's in a very <laughs> uh, snarky discotheque. snarky mood oh, no, I was going to go with your mood but yeah you, you, you got the discotheque lighting going on um but you're you're in a very catty mood tonight for some reason. Okay, let's move on. What? What? You making that face at me, saying that is just for the proof that you're in a you're in a I don't know. I'm trying to have a better word than catty. You're in a snappy mood. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to move on? You know what? I think you're right. Yeah, we'll move on. <laughs> we'll move on. Tara, uh, did you? Maybe I would have been in a better mood if I liked this movie more. Oh, go on then. How do you feel? Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's it's kind of boring. Um, uh, some of the acting really wasn't very good. Even uh, one from an actor that I I do really like, but um thought he wasn't very good in it and i don't know like the the family dynamic that i really wanted to have an emotional connection to i didn't get and i know these are fine actors so i think maybe it was a just a direction it's just a directing problem Uh, is it a new director um let me go look her up uh julia hart is the director she also co-wrote the script this is her second movie. She directed Miss Stevens before this. I don't know what that is, but yeah, I mean, it's not a bad movie. I just didn't, I just didn't care about anything while I was watching it. I didn't care about the abilities. I didn't care about uh, the situation. <laughs> I thought it was just kind of a, it's kind of kind of bland. And when like the big stuff happened that was supposed to be emotional, like I didn't. I wasn't really invested. What about you? Um, I'm going to blow your mind. I'm going to sum up everything you just said here. I've, I've got a phrase for this. I've got a phrase for what this movie is. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's not, but it is, right? It's not actually this, but it essentially is. And that is a Netflix movie. <laughs> 
Yeah, maybe. Um, That's what it felt like to me. And again, I think Netflix movies kind of look better than this, but uh, yeah, maybe. it's not a look that I typically like. I don't have a problem with the look so much. Um, I, I think for me, what was frustrating about this movie is that I really like the trailer. I like the the premise. Yeah, the trailer was great. And the general idea, which is good, because they've already announced they're doing a TV show of this um, on Amazon. So, oh, okay. Which is interesting because I think there's all the pieces that are that are here could become a great TV show. I think the problem with this movie for me is that it just it feels like it's very like half measures in almost everything it does, and as a result, it, the pacing feels kind of a slog, and because i think the, i think the best part of the movie is actually is probably the core actors uh the still the these in particular I, I think they when they start fighting with each other and like that it feels like real people fighting you know it doesn't feel like it's you yeah, know i don't know i didn't really get a lot of chemistry from them like between because there are three generations of like mother daughter and i just didn't i think it i didn't get that they were all related to each other it didn't they they seem distant to but not like relative distant. Um, yeah, I guess you could explain that though, given that uh, Ruth, the main character, has been missing in her daughter's life for mo- mo- most of it, basically. Um, they don't really know each other, so I suppose you could explain that that way. I like because there's so many things in this movie though. When I, when I talk about the elements all feeling like they're they're not quite what I want, but they're getting they're they're kind of close, which is really frustrating. Mm-hmm. Because I think like the visuals that I saw in the trailer, like I really liked, but then it felt like the movie didn't really deliver much more of them. You know, the, the bright colors and the, the more fantastical stuff. And then the music. There was moments where I thought the music was about to do something really cool, and I thought, oh, this is exactly the sort of music this movie needs. And then it just never quite did what it felt like it should. Yeah, I noticed. I don't normally notice like music, but I definitely noticed it in this. Like in the very beginning, she's like escaping from something, and it has. A soundtrack over top of a car alarm and i thought that's kind of interesting because they don't really line up the car alarm and the or and the uh the music but it sounds but they're like equal volume so it seems like they should kind of line up better and it was just kind of throwing me off and then there's another scene where it's like a almost like a tron soundtrack comes in and i actually really like that that score but then it disappears for the rest of the movie. So it seems... Yeah, the opening, the opening like, 15 minutes... I don't know. Minutes, it doesn't seem consistent. The opening 15, 20 minutes is probably the best part of the movie because it feels like it has urgency to it because it feels like she's on the run and we're learning things about yeah. her as it goes. Uh, once she gets to the house, though, and it's her and the family, it does kind of feel like, okay, we have to make, the, make most of the fact that we only have so much money to shoot this movie, so most of it's going to be at the house now. And then... Yeah, that's like... 80 percent of the movie it is no it's, it's a lot of it um and then there's the, the, obviously the one big thing towards the end uh this, this, the climatic scene and the climatic scene is decent um but it, it it definitely felt like to me that they had this idea and they had i don't know like okay we've got the budget for like eight effect shots i mean it's, i think it's more than that but i'm just just for, just for the sake of this conversation we've got the mm-hmm. budget for eight effect shots so we have to make those eight effect shots count but I don't actually think um, it's enough. Or, like, honestly, with the amount of effects money they had, given what's on the screen, I would have saved all of it for the ending. I, I would have just hinted at things for the whole movie and not shown a damn thing and then have it go nuts at the end. Um, cause... Yeah, when you do get to see, like, the special effects, they look cool, I think. Hmm. Um, but it wasn't enough to really keep me very interested. I, like you're right. I was more interested in the beginning because it was like a chase, and yeah, there and was it was faster pace, and you know you, you get introduced to a villain, and you're like, oh, like uh, yeah, this is what this movie's going to be. There's a really cool like escape scene or like a fight. And and, what, and what's key about that opening chunk of the movie? There's there's really no visual effects in it beyond simple you know normal stuff. There's no flashy things. It's just people right. in cars. It's people having conversations. People. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and we're learning stuff about the world. You know, we learn. You know, she goes to get a motel room, and the water is is more valuable than the hotel room. Like, you know, it's like, hey, right. it's twenty five dollars for the night at the hotel, but it'll cost you fifty for the water. And it's like, oh, okay, because mm-hmm. we we learn at the start of the movie that this is a world. This is part of the science fiction of it. This this you know, Earth in this movie 
it stopped raining and water is like this highly valued commodity now where everyone has to go buy jugs of it and it costs a fortune and that's what most people spend their money on now right i mean it's a it seems like a not too distant future especially right now with the amazon on fire the think, amazon is on fire <laughs> the amazon is on fire that is true and we're not talking about like like amazon's warehouse where they, they ship your 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 cd players from well anyone buy cd players anymore i don't know why i said cd players <laughs> i still look such an old man there <laughs> that's a good question walkmans before yeah <laughs> can, can, can you actually order a cd player off amazon right now do they still sell like a cd player oh they sell everything so i'm sure yeah i, I bet there's probably still like hi-fi systems that still technically have cd players in them just because it's like it has you know tape players in them still just for the sake of having everything playable I mean, they still sell CDs at stores. That's true. That's true. I'm almost... So instead of being old, I'm actually too... I'm, I'm second-guessing myself, and I'm actually too hip and young because I've not touched a CD <laughs> in, like, decades. Yeah, you're right. You're just trying to compensate. I get it. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? You know, the first 15, 20 minutes, I thought I was going to like it. Um, are you playing with your cat? Um. Yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> I'm listening. It's just really distracting. You're looking down the whole time. So if something's more interesting than me. I'm sorry. I'm. You have my full attention. Good. You know, the movie does a lot of world building in the opening chunk. It's kind of dark and broody. The direction feels at its strongest in this opening chunk as well. Um, you know, we're learning about her, what, what she does, what the world's like. Uh, we, as you said, we get interested in this villain kind of early on, and it's done in kind of a, a quiet way. And that's actually one of the other big problems of the movie, is that I think that all of the elements that are outside of the main core three characters, the, 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 the family members, all those other elements feel very kind of, like, just like they're afterthoughts, where there's almost no, nothing happening in the other subplots. They go away for so long. Um, the, the character, the villain who's kind of, like, trying to find her, after his, his introduction is good. After that, he has nothing worthwhile. Every scene with him made me sleepy. Mm -hmm. And the same with uh, David Strathairn, who I like. Typically, um, I think his subplot where he's the sheriff going through the town and, and looking... Because there's an incident early on uh, that's sort of like, okay, this is a crime scene. And, and so trying to solve the crime, it's kind of leading them towards her as well. And as he's going around just asking people questions, and it's people who we've already seen her interact with... All of those scenes all play the exact same way. Every single one's him walking into the room, uh, whether it's the bar or the gas station, wherever, and he says, you know, did you see someone? And they'll say, yeah. Oh, I'd like to ask you some questions. Cut to a different scene. And they all play the exact same way. So by the time it happened the second or third time, I just kind of went, okay, I saw I saw this scene twice already. You're doing the exact yeah. same thing. Um yeah, I, I kind of like com would compare those scenes that, while I was watching this to like um, No Country for Old Men because they had like similar <laughs> interrogation scenes like that with the cop coming in and, and checking things out. And it like those scenes are so engaging and so interesting, even though they also kind of have those repeated patterns. And I think it's just because of just direction, like the Coen brothers are masters. And I think, well, I think it's two things. I think it's direction and I think it's dialogue. I think the dialogue is, in of itself is just more interesting. Like, mm -hmm. you know, because that's because it would be these scenes would be fine if the conversation kept going and we got to hear what the actual conversation was, but we don't. It's, it's this tease yeah. like multiple times just, just to tell it, just to let us know that he's talking to them. All we really need to see this is while it's montaging, just show us in those locations. We don't actually have to hear dialogue from him at all in those scenes because we get no mm -hmm. information from him anyway. We get no information from those scenes other than the fact that he's talking to these people. So all we need to do is occasionally see him there, if that. And honestly, even then, like, he could just say that he talked to these people later on. It wouldn't matter. Like, it's not that much right. of a... So, and I, I get the whole point is that we're meant to suspect that he's getting closer and closer and we should be worried about this. Um, even though there's some other elements to it that kind of make that irrelevant. Um, but it never really feels that way. He seems just felt kind of tedious to me. Yeah, I... I agree. Like, um, yeah, the first 15 minutes was promising a movie that I think I could really get into. And although it did kind of come off as, yeah, like you said, a little Netflixy, uh, but then it just kind of grinds to a halt and just doesn't move. 
Do you know what it is? It, it's, it's like Looper, except Looper at least got halfway through the movie before it grinded to a halt and became unbearable. Mm, I don't remember. I remember liking that movie. I know you've mentioned that you don't like it, but it has been a while since I've seen it. I saw it in theaters once. It, well, we'll watch it. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that at some point. But we, I, you know, I saw that in theaters as well, and I just like, like. I love the concept of that movie, but then it just grew to a halt afterwards and it was all just set on a farm. And this movie's kind of like that, but just earlier on, it's like half an hour in uh, at best. It's like, okay, we're at this house now. We are never really going to leave this house, barring a couple of little scenes here or there. Like, we're just going to be here. And that wouldn't even necessarily be a problem if it felt like there was good drama happening at the house. But it's so relaxed. And that, this is where I get to talking uh, compared to a Netflix movie, because I feel like a lot of Netflix movies have this kind of we're going through the motion to fill the runtime, but we only actually have enough plot for like half of it. <laughs> so we have a lot of intentionally yeah. dragged out scenes um, that don't really or quite. It's like character interactions that I don't really buy. Mm. You know, there's there's like a moment where she be- where Ruth becomes very open with her daughter, and I just don't I don't buy it. Like I don't I don't buy that this character would have that conversation with her. Or like the 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 little girl is trying to like get a truck started and she's like eight years old and working on a truck and like clearly her grandmother doesn't know how to work on a truck so where is she learning how to do this and like it I don't know I, I mean everyone's allowed to have a hobby but I just don't buy it <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean I have a problem with that it's just a quirky like, oh look, the ten year old likes to work as a mechanic <laughs> like fine I'll, I'll go with it she likes doing stuff okay. like that whatever. I actually am quite hopeful for the TV show because I think all the elements are there. Um, as long as it's not 10 episodes of being at the house, <laughs> having the same conversations. Because yeah. um, the, the movie in a lot of ways, like even the ending feels like it's just the start of the story. It feels like this is just the prologue to whatever the real story is going to be in a lot of ways. Is a is the show going to be a reboot then? Or, or is it a continuation of this? No, a reboot. It's going is to be... Is this like what the Dark Tower was supposed to be? No, no. It's going to be more like... Um... Just taking the concept and doing their own thing, like kind of like the Hannah TV show did recently on Amazon. Um, and I suppose to an extent, you could say the hit television show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but not really, because at least in Buffy, like the movie kind of still happened before it, but not exactly as it did, kind of thing. What's that look? <laughs> Why are you in such a mood? It's not the seventh yet. How dare you! <laughs> You don't get to be mad at me for that. You love that joke. You remain. You remain what the dialogue was. Oh dear! I love how the audio people aren't getting these glares. I'm getting so many glares tonight for very fair statements. May I add, very fair statements. Yeah, yeah. You got your reference in. What was the, the hostility I just, today? I don't know. I'm just in a funk because I just watched this movie and I didn't really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was very good. Well, let's, I'll tell you what. Let's give the spoiler warning. Full spoilers for, for Fast Color. Although, before we go into the, the spoilers, you can, of course, support us financially. Where, Tara? Where can they do that? Yeah, you can go to Malfa's TV, Patreon, and donate like a dollar. And it'll get you bonus episodes. We did Time Cop recently, and that was pretty fun. I'm in a much better mood on that one. <laughs> uh, that's uh, patreon.com slash Um mm-hmm. you, you may have neglected to give the address. Uh, oh, what is this episode? What is Am this I getting one? fired? <laughs> I'm thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, full spoilers. All right, you know what? You're in a bad mood because of the movie. I want to hear passion. I want to hear passion as to why you don't like this. So It's not... It's not a movie that I can be passionate about, though. Like, even my dislike of it is not... It's not like Captive State dislike. It's just, like, boredom. <laughs> this movie's boring. So, Lila, uh, the the young kid, uh, she she can sort of dematerialize things into dust and then reform them back into things. But she she can't take something that's broken and reform it to be fixed again. Ha- she can only reform things that she herself has taken apart with her power. Um, although mm-hmm. it felt like the movie was trying to set up that she would eventually be able, be able to because there's a whole scene where uh, Ruth kind of like forces her to try and fix a broken window and it doesn't work but it felt like oh this, they're doing this because at the end there's going to be a big moment where she does it she's going to like reform something 
Right. I thought maybe they're going to like combine powers or something yeah. <laughs> with the, you know, strength of family love. You'll be able to. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was going in that direction. And it didn't, you know. It didn't, yeah. Um, and Bo has the same powers, essentially, although it seems to be potentially... Like, maybe not weaker right now, but she seems to think that, that Lila will have be much more bit powerful at it uh, when she's older, and she's got even more control. Um, and then Ruth did technically have this power, or she should have had this power. But in her youth, she, she started having these seizures, and once the seizures started... The power stopped, but when she has a seizure, it causes an earthquake in places that don't have earthquakes. So that's kind of what we learn about her. She she's been on the run because she essentially became a junkie because drugs stopped the power or stopped the seizures from happening and kept it safe. But she got knocked up. She came home. She had Lila, and then the seizures started up again. And it was too dangerous for the baby. It was a big revelation at the end. Exactly the moment that made her leave home again. But mm -hmm. um, she, so she she goes and she's away for years. Uh, you know, from from Lila being a baby to like what was she now ten nine? Yeah, she looks about ten. Some of like that, and she comes back because she's on the run. Uh, these government scientists are after her because she she you know they can experiment on her and do things with her powers and all sorts, and. She comes home. We never really get like a whole lot of context for where she was exactly at the start of the movie because she she had like her hands tied in rope and everything. There was a whole, um, like suggested. Yeah, like, and the person who's after her, she doesn't recognize. So he seems to come from a different place. Yeah, or at the very least, maybe it was just a henchman the first time, and then he came in personally afterwards. And the ability actually reminds me of a book series that I started to read. Um, cause I was looking for something new to read and I just went to the Hugo award list, which is the, like, uh, achievements in literature and science fiction and fantasy. Of course they combine it. Um, uh, even though it shouldn't be combined, it should be separate. It should be separate. <laughs> I agree. And so, and this, uh, this one author, uh, wrote, a, 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 I think a trilogy of books. Her name is like NK Jiminson or something. And um, the first one's called The Fifth Season. I got through about a third of it, but it is more fantasy, so I, I, I didn't stick with it. There, there was a movie of that, right? Like... Chloe Grace hmm? Moretz was in a movie of that. The Fifth? Oh, that was The Fifth, fifth Wave. Season? I think it was called. That was The Fifth Wave. Maybe it's not the same thing. Okay, I think that is an alien movie, so we might have to watch it. Not uh, looking forward to that day. Uh, um, uh, yeah, this was like Fifth Season, and then the sequel was called The Obelisk Gate. And I don't know what the third one was called, but um, it was a. It's about like a like people who have an ability to create earthquakes. And um, interestingly enough, it's all the main characters are like women of color who have the ability. And same, the author is also a woman of color, and all these characters are as well in the film. So it like it made me have that connection I, I can't help but think that there wasn't some influence there <laughs> uh, maybe. maybe it's just coincidental but like that's what they're that was the kind of the neat thing about the the book series even though i don't really like fantasy that much is that they had this unique ability to like to change things of earth they use like their elemental powers were like creating earthquakes and but it would draw energy like heat from people around them which would like kill them so that's kind of cool. If you're trying, <laughs> if you're trying not to get fired, remind me that you don't like fantasy, but you like sci-fi. It's a good start. As a, yeah. as a, as a point in the got me the job in the first place. Yeah, that's a that's a point in the I may not fire her column. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have to talk about that. Actually, we have to talk about the fact that we're dealing with three three women here, and we're dealing with uh, women of color specifically because I feel like thematically there are some things going on here. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think the movie does a great job of actually trying to say what it's trying to say. Because I don't think it's super clear, um, mm -hmm. and because I, I thought it would be like I went into this movie thinking it was going to have a nice little message, it's going to be uplifting, and by the end of the film, I felt very kind of confused by what it was actually doing. <laughs> I wasn't entirely sure. And, yeah. Because I thought, oh, you know, b by the end, it's like okay, so you've got because because you know the, the the scientist chasing her, and I think even all of his henchmen are all white, right? So I think you've got some mm -hmm. potential analysis there to talk about with the idea that 
um black women uh have in theory the power to help the world right because this world is mm-hmm. especially in this movie is literally broken and not functioning the way it's supposed to and the idea that black women might actually have the key but ultimately they've been ignored and forced into hiding forced into hiding and, and to an extent abused and because of that um they're they're not helping at all they're they're hiding uh because they're too scared and the ending, yeah, they literally have a, a connection to the earth like yeah someone gets upset and they cause a seizure that causes an earthquake like yeah yeah uh, and at the end of the movie when um bo like gives herself in says no no let them go I, you can you can work with me i'll do, i'll work with the scientists and do things that like because to, to me them not having this like violent like ending or having this anybody beat the bad guys and they're just all dead or whatever to me it says no the, the point of this movie to some extent is about learn to like copyright uh, copyright cooperate <laughs> to copyright trademark to copyright and trademark <laughs> your superpowers so no one can abuse them no but like i was kind of reading that as okay right so you have to actually work with us and not just hunt us and like think that you can put us in a lab somewhere like we have to be willing we have to work together and we have to solve these problems uh as as a society kind of thing and then they, they, again that also so I, I think it's i think it's very specific that we're dealing Guess, with maybe you women. can make the connection to henry henrietta lax which is uh was a was a black woman who's um she has some kind of like super blood which has been cloned and used in um in research in scientific research uh for the last like 50 years or something maybe even more and extensive research for like uh, for cancer and such and it's because of this one woman's blood that um we have so many medical advancements and it was a, a movie that hbo did with oprah which actually wasn't very good but i'm glad i know about her now and um <clears throat> and she was a black woman who's was basically used for her blood and um i think died in a not anything to do with the with the uh, the science experiments but like ended up dying and leaving a family and even though her her blood is still used today, like their their family is is poor and like has nothing, and they've been trying to fight to like get some kind of compensation at least, but um, you know, uh, they they get nothing. So, so what's that? What's, what's that you're telling me? The the greedy corporate uh, healthcare system <laughs> of of the U.S. Uh, is all about money until it's about paying someone who who donated this magical blood that's actually helped everything yeah. for the last fifty years. I'm shocked. I'm shocked, Tara. <laughs> right. She was, you know, a, a black female, and I mean, these are scientists who are trying to basically just use this woman for their own advancement they don't care about her well-being they just care about what she can provide them yeah so i think that's in there i i don't know if the movie goes far enough because like like i say every time we cut back to like the you know what was his name bill the scientist like his introduction mm-hmm. was okay where he, he just pretends to be a stranger at the, the cafe and he buys her like this fake coffee they all drink now because water's expensive just makes some small talk and then he kind of like you know rescues her from the cop because the cop's checking her stolen car and he's like oh hey honey over here and he's like oh let me help you let me drive you to wherever you're going and then he like it kind of he slowly reveals in the conversation but that scene for me even though i like his introduction at the, the cafe i think this scene even though i like the end of it with um the actual gun where she ends up shooting him in the hand and it's a bit of a struggle uh, in the car yeah that scene was good i think no, that's had, good um i had think some kind of action <laughs> I think the problem for me, though, or the the, the the troubling sign for me in this scene for the rest, the, that became true for the rest of the movie, is that the actual conversation where he reveals that he, he's looking for her and that he knows about what happened and that she caused an earthquake at this hotel or motel the night before. Um, and, you know, and that scene itself was fine. You know, we learned stuff about her talking to the, the woman at the counter and we we got uh, learned about her seizure and we also learned that she's got a bit of a, a heart because she, she called and warned the, the you know the, the manager and said hey take your daughter under a table or something like that um so that taught us a lot of things and it still was in that middle of the first like 15 minutes but mm-hmm. this conversation where he just kind of like says oh so did you hear about uh the earthquake at the the motel um and it was yeah apparently you know there's never been an earthquake here apparently a woman uh, called the front desk and i'm like this is the most boring possible way he could reveal this to her 
I actually thought he wasn't very good. Maybe that's the main problem. Maybe, maybe it is a lot of it's down to the actor. Um, like, I think he was kind of giving me like, uh, uh, like just amateur vibes. Yeah, I can I can agree with that because that that scene like I felt like that should be a big deal is like and it should have been longer. There should have been a longer conversation before they kind of got to the the point where it's like oh yeah. shit he knows who she is. Also, I think I had an issue with him being like a being a villain because he was just so like dorky looking <laughs> to me. <laughs> he didn't look threatening at all. And yeah. I know he's just a scientist and that kind of helps, but like. I don't know, like, uh, he didn't really come off as very threatening to me. Yeah, I think that's fair. And honestly, like, every scene that we get with him after this, because we see him, like, go to the interview... They're, they're not good. No, they're not. Like, there's just these little scenes where he goes to the places that she's also been, much like uh, the sheriff also goes to. The sheriff, right? yeah. And then we have a scene with him arguing with his boss, um, and a scene of him going to the police station with some goons, and that's about it, like... That, this is the thing, all these scenes with him or the scenes with the sheriff, they all felt like okay, we want these like plot beats to be advancing in the movie, but we don't actually have anything interesting for them to do or say, we just have to kind of get the point across and it makes them all very tedious to watch because they're all just these quick little snippets They feel like nothing of real note happens and that felt amateur to me, That that's what made it feel amateur to me, was uh, how certain scenes, even though they technically give me a bit of plot advancement, I was still kind of going, that felt pointless and that, that's a problem. It's a, it's a, it's a problem. Um, and I, I think it looks okay visually, admittedly. Um, I think it's the script and the direction of actors that I think needs to be completely overhauled. Yeah, I'm just kind of over these, like, post-Logan, Logan films. Like, I, I was really into the Logan movie because I cared about the Wolverine character after so, so many films. you were into Logan, but not the post-Logan Logan. Logan. Yeah, but like all these other movies that are just about like one person's boring journey through a desert, like, <laughs> well, they try to discover who they are. I, I don't know. Like, we seem to have a lot of films trying to be like Logan since then, and I'm just not into them. I actually, I don't think Logan caused it bizarre. I feel like that's always been a thing in movies like this. It's just that Logan gave us a successful example. <laughs> So now, now we have like this. Maybe successful because it was like a to. mainstream franchise yeah. that went back to an indie style film. Yeah. To be fair, I think there's lots of indie movies that do pull it off. I think it's just this is just a, a case of like a lot of the cheap ones that don't pull it off try it because it's it's kind of like why a lot of horror movies that are dirt cheap shoot in the woods because it's cheap to shoot in the woods, but it doesn't mean anything yeah. if you're not good at it because just because you're shooting the woods doesn't it's mean it's cheap if your future is like a Mad Max like post-apocalyptic because you can just go to the desert <laughs> sure exactly um so it's cheap but just because you shoot in the jungle doesn't mean that you're going to end up looking like predator you still have to have someone with skill in like a you know a proper team making it look good so yeah you know it's kind of a we should review predator i need a good movie um we're, we're gonna get to predator don't you worry good. They're, they're on the menu <laughs> they're on the menu um and we do have some passionate stuff coming up in a couple of weeks time i'm gonna say good but passionate <laughs> more terminator oh yeah we got more terminator coming baby <laughs> once once the movie gets going at the house um it's a lot of them talking to each it's other it's not the phrasing i would have used <laughs> okay gets going is maybe not the I, I just mean the sense that it's the main chunk because once she gets there that's kind of the bulk of the movie so mm -hmm. We have, like, the daughter being introduced to her, and we have the daughter showing off her powers with the bowl, and, you know, Ruth tries to, like, use her power on the bowl, but ends up smashing the window upstairs instead, and just all these things. Uh, obviously, one of the few moments it gets kind of interesting is when she's trying really hard to, like, meditate and focus, and we can actually see the cloud behind her, like, change shape. Like, it's starting to, you know, come to life almost. And I'm like, okay, that's actually quite a cool visual. I'm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. on board with that. I agree. Um, there should be more of that. Uh, and it happens, like, one more time, kind of. Or, well, two, technically. Um, pretty close t together, though. So, mm -hmm. that that is, like, kind of the, the whole idea is that Ruth can manipulate the planet. She Not only can she cause the earthquake, she can literally form... And... She can bring water back, right? Yeah, she, she can bring rain back. She can form clouds and bring rain back. She can tear open the sky as... Her mother put it when she told her about this uh, 
as far as we know, a fake person she made up. Like, oh, there's other people like us other, all over the planet. And there's this this girl in, in Europe who can tear up in the sky. Uh, mm-hmm. But when Ruth's telling this to, to Lila, she's like, no, that was that was fake. You know, uh, your grandmother made that up to try and make me feel better. Um, uh, but of course, the big twist at the end is, is that, well, I'll say a big twist. <laughs> you know, uh, at the end, she gets a note from, from Bo, her mother, saying, no, that person is real. There's people like us all over. Go find them and start, you know, change the world. You know, it's not just us. Which again goes back into what we're talking about with the the message of like them, you know, r- you know, rising and changing the world and actually not being ignored anymore. It's it's there uh, as Tara rolls her eyes just slightly. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think the the abilities that they have are pretty cool. Like, I like the idea that. You know, she can form a cloud. It was kind of a cool effect when it dissipated and the, all the moisture just went back into the ground because she's, you know, forming a cloud out of presumably the moisture in the earth. And um, it was a cool effect. And I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm not into it. <laughs> I'm not into this movie at all. Yeah, um, well... I don't care about any sequels or TV shows that are coming out for it. I hope it's good for fans. Well, I'm intrigued by the TV show because the TV show won't be the same as the movie. It'll be taking the concept of the movie and doing its own thing. Yeah, so... it's going to go like the unbreakable route or something, you know. There's more. Come and find us. Um, I, yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, I'd compare it more to like Westworld, which is a pretty mediocre movie. Uh, and then turned into the Westworld TV show, which is, I mean, I'm not saying it will be that good. I'm saying it was a potential yeah, maybe, for that. Yeah. I think it's different though, because this is so close. Well, is it we're... the same people who are involved? I don't think so. At least, I mean, maybe, maybe she is involved, the director, I don't well, know. The, she's a co-writer of the script, right? So Maybe she'll do better. Okay. Maybe she may actually have more budget per episode versus the movie. I mean, that may actually be the case, to be honest, given, because Amazon shows can actually look quite pricey, uh, some of them. They they're pumping money yeah, in their content right now. Yeah, looking forward to the Lord of the Rings one, uh, well, <laughs> the one fantasy that I do love. A little bit. Um, I, I mean, no, because I I wouldn't just say I'm not into it. I, I think I'm I'm in, I actually I'm into it annoyingly, but I'm just not into the movie because the movie just keeps doing things to make it less interesting. Um, mm-hmm. it it keeps sucking the life out of its own story by having them just kind of stand around and do nothing. And I feel like. I hate using phrases like that, I really do, because I feel like idiots who don't know how to talk about movies say that about lots of good movies because they don't understand <laughs> the difference between a, an engaging conversation. You know, there's people who will watch like a Tarantino movie and say nothing happened for 30 minutes because it was just people talking. But the, the talking in and of itself I mean, can be very that's entertaining. That's what you go to a Tarantino movie for, is for the dialogue. Yeah, but like that's why i hate using that that statement but that's how it feels like i'm not saying what's literally happening because honestly them being at a house for the entire movie could be fine if the if the writing was there to actually make it engaging between the characters but the problem Mm -hmm. is is that it just feels like they're standing around doing very little of anything because that's the feeling you get from the movie yeah and the point of the film is not really that clear no i I don't think so either I, i think because it wants the big moment it wants the big moment where, where, when she's going to run away again but she knows the bad guys are coming for her and she goes out and she's driving out into the desert and the car breaks down and she's you know she's going to get the uh the gas but she ends up you know collapsing because she's she's starting to have a seizure uh in the desert and this is where she realizes she, she fights the memory we get to see the memory which is that her seizure the first seizure she had when lila was a baby and um, almost killed lila because it burst the pipe and the, she almost drowned uh, in, in the mm-hmm. room and she but she, she sort of lets go with that memory and like stands up and she realizes she made it rain a little bit and she can see the colors because that's one of the things we've not mentioned yet and kind of where the title of the movie comes from is that when they use their powers they can see this after image of colors in in the in the world and yeah it looked okay yeah no it was a fight, fun bright visual that it felt kind of uh, hypnotic and you know, otherworldly, I guess, to put it. It felt mm-hmm. like we were seeing something, like, out there. And, you know, the, the music gets all happy here, and she drives back home, and but then she finds out that the bad guys came and kidnapped her daughter, and uh, she has to go and save them. And so the big final of the movie is her just going out there, and she makes it rain in town. She, she, you know, she stands there, she uses her powers, and makes it just proper, you know, pissed-down rain. Mm-hmm. And 
then her mum, Bo, uses her powers to dismantle all the guns that they try and hold up on, uh, to them. But she agrees to go with them because she doesn't want to run anymore. She doesn't want to hide. She wants to try and work with them so they don't have to live in fear. And she dissolves the door for her daughter. Or for her granddaughter, I think. I don't think her, her granddaughter did it on her own. Um, Yeah, I think her reforming it tells us that it was her that deformed it in the first place. I was under the impression that she, that her granddaughter... Lily tried, or Lilith tried to do it, like try to deform the door and couldn't do it, and oh, so she it does. just kind of snapped back into place. And then her grandmother, when she deformed the guns, she also took the door down. No, no, you're right. You're right. She did try. Okay. She, that scene is there where she tries and it fails. Um, which is because so you could read it either as she f- ends up being able to towards the end, or it's just a case of her grandmother. But I think her grandmother reforms the door when she goes into the police station, and I think because they can only reform things they, they themselves have deformed, I feel like that implies that it was her uh, that, that mm-hmm. deformed the doors. The movie is very underwhelming. It's very lackluster, and it's a shame because the concepts it's working with are actually kind of great. And I, I love a good indie sci-fi. I love a good indie story where you get, you get this great, great great character journey and it feels kind of it feels intimate and it feels like oh it's something you don't get in you know regular mainstream movies unfortunately mm-hmm. this reminds me of netflix movies where it feels more like it's plodding because it doesn't actually know how to write a script or the you know the, the writers don't know how to like pace a script properly and write dialogue yeah. that's engaging between the characters and it feels like there's not enough really happening or going on uh, in their journey. Because it's one of those movies where I realized I was like 20 minutes from the end. I was like, really? I've only got 20 minutes left? How? Not enough's <laughs> happened. Like, we're not done enough to set up a proper ending that's going to hit me hard. And... Yeah. Uh, I, I had to pause at like the halfway point to walk my dog. And, well, I, I went to pause it and I couldn't believe how much time I still had left on it. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> this is so boring. <laughs> Uh, yeah, not not great. Um, not the worst thing we've watched, but like... I don't, I'm getting from this conversation, it's one of the hardest ones we've had to talk about because there's less to say about well, it. Well, it's just not anything that happens. And the stuff that does happen doesn't really feel important. It wants to feel important. That ending's supposed to feel important. You can tell by the way it's shot and the way that they make it this big climatic thing, but ultimately... They've just not earned it throughout the film. Yeah. They've not they've not earned this moment with these characters. Um Yeah. But <laughs> I think this movie got pretty good reviews, didn't it? It got decent reviews, yeah. Um because if we're if we're comparing it to like Netflix movies, I'd I'd say it's probably better than I Am Mother, since that's the one that we reviewed a while ago. But not by much. Yeah, I maybe. They're about on par for me. At least visually I thought I Am Mother was decent but i don't remember what i rated it to so when i rate this movie i hope i don't rate it <laughs> like yeah um, I, i've got I'm a rating in mind for than this I am mother. yeah i have got a rating in mind for this it's a frustrating film because i want to like it and I, I want i want to be into what it sets up and it starts off promising enough and i just i guess you summed up at the start it was kind of boring and <laughs> not that engaging but we strive to go beyond just it's kind of boring <laughs> on this show yeah we went into depth about how boring it was so. <laughs> i think we've justified it okay okay so uh tara uh, what would you rate this movie then um yeah i want to sum up my thoughts overall before i do the rating like i do for all of them but uh, I think I'll just be repeating everything that I've, the one thing that I've said throughout this whole thing, which was that it was boring and I didn't care. So I'm going to give it a four. Okay. Pretty low. <laughs> like the consequences seem like nothing for every action in this film. At least as, as far as the story goes, it's just bland. It's just, I don't know the reason I watched this, this journey. <laughs> because uh, you're on a sci-fi podcast and it was the next on the list <laughs> that's that's <laughs> that's the real answer why but that's fair that's fair um i mean when i started watching this i'm like it's probably going to be like a seven film and then it went to six and then it went to five and after we done talked about it i'm like yeah it's a four i don't like it <laughs> that's rough that's rough um i 
I don't know if I can go quite as harsh as a four. For me, this is this is the definition of a five out of ten. This is like not offensively bad. There's nothing wrong with like it's not doing anything like infuriating, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not doing anything particularly like it, it feels like it's a frustrating one because it's a missed opportunity based on the concepts that it has. And some people may argue that you should rate lower because it whiffs on an idea, it whiffs on the potential. But at the same time, I look at what maybe, I, but we didn't rate you know the final countdown that low because it was still enjoyable even though it whiffs on its potential. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but th this for me is straight down the middle because for every everything that I kind of like or like idea wise, or there's something else that just feels kind of off. Like the music almost gets really good, but it just doesn't quite get there. Uh, the cinematography is decent in places, but in other places it just feels kind of mundane. Uh, the acting, I think, is good from some of the actors in certain scenes, but then it's just kind of whatever for the rest of it. But I, I think the problems with the acting is not down to the cast. I think it's down to the directing. Um, and I think it's down yeah. to the dialogue. I don't think it's to do with um, with uh, just raw Gugu. performance, you know? Uh, with Gugu? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, she's one of the better actors in it as well, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, 5 out of 10 from me. That's what it is. So, um, not great, not terrible. Not great. Oh, that's 3.6. That's 3.6. I feel like you have to be rating things out of 5 for that, that number to make sense. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's because 3.6 out of 10 sounds terrible. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's something you don't want to watch. Um, but yeah, that is, a, that is a fast color. So we will actually have a bonus section on this episode. We will be talking about a Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode. Um, we finally did it. We finally did it. Um, and we'll try our best to not have as big a gap before the next one. Because um, the last one we did was on Mothra, I believe. And I've not been back and counted how many episodes that is, but it's something like five or six. <laughs> There's a few. Um, so... Yes, before, I got a new job, so sorry. It's been, it's been yeah, it's been a rough settling in period, but we're, we'll be back to we'll be back with a uh, laser mm -mm. quest, no? Oh, for next time. For next time, yeah, laser. What, laser blast. Laser blast, yeah, laser blast gonna be the next one. But the one we're doing on this episode is hobgoblins, as promised, as advertised. Um, Hobgoblins. Before we get to that, though, uh, I will take this time to thank you for uh, watching and listening, and also like and subscribe, all these other things. You can rate the podcast on your podcast app. Five stars, ideally. Although, I don't really blame you if the, this episode didn't inspire the five-star rating. If you want to just, you know, wait until you get another good episode and then rate it as five stars, I'll understand. Um, hey, I brought my A-game today. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you've been delightful, Tara. I promise. <laughs> Thanks. You've you've been you've been delightfully cynical and and sarcastic. It's been yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, I get it. We, we, look, we all have like I'm sure we're I not can, all going to be winners. <laughs> I'm sure I can think of a few reviews I've done in the past where I know I was I was mopey as hell the entire time. They've happened. They've happened. <laughs> so like, subscribe, all the usual things. Uh, we already mentioned Patreon halfway through the show. Uh, so go do all those things and obviously check out all the stuff we do uh, we have a horror movie podcast called Streams After Midnight uh, that I do with Tim which is kind of like this show but with horror movies and um, we do a little bit of horror movie news every week and we talk about horror movie and it's good fun so uh, you can do that and that's the one of the other things you get a bonus episode of uh, at the $1 tier on Patreon so uh, we're checking out Tara you can uh, plug something check out our Twilight Zone reviews we're reviewing the classic episodes of the twilight zone um we also do some hbo stuff uh right now we're reviewing a show called our boys that's really great i don't know if it's really for science fiction fans but not a lot of people are watching it so um it is really good we are both really into it so spread the word yeah it's good. It's good more stuff. people should watch it um so with that said we can go into the bonus section now which is Mystery Science Theater 2000, and it is the episode of Hob Goblins, which I had never seen before. I mean, I've never seen any of the ones we've done yet before, but I mentioned this one because this one's rather famous, this episode, because this is one of the few ones where I'd heard of it. You know, I'd, I'd heard of Space Mutiny, I'd heard of uh, Man is the Hands of Fate. I think Hob Goblins is another one that came up a lot, and then one of the first times me and Tara ever spoke about Mystery Science Theater, she couldn't help but not talk about the rake fight, which... Uh, comes up early on in this legendary so the premise of this this movie hobgoblins is that an old security guard 
uh, hires a, a young assistant, uh, another security guard, to work with them, and they look after this building that has nothing in it. It's like an old recording studio or something like that. But there's a vault. It's a big vault with bars around it for some reason, um, uh, of which the joke is made <laughs> about the vault killing a man, and that's why he's behind bars. <laughs> um, and but in the, in that vault, what he's actually protecting is these mysterious creatures, these gremlin knockoffs called hobgoblins which can make you imagine things as well as just want to generally kill people and all sorts. And for some reason, they always get accompanied with this harsh green light. And I, I thought the, the guy had discovered kryptonite when he was walking in there the first time. <laughs> uh, so, of course, uh, the first security guard dies. He has a new one. <laughs> and then, of course, they get out um, because... The hobgoblins escape. And a... they are so adorable. <laughs> Ador- I don't know about adorable. I mean, <laughs> that's a there's bit of a stretch. There's little puppets and dolls that like drive golf carts around. Yes, there is a golf cart, um, which was one of my favorite jokes, actually, is there's a flashback to this old security guard when he was like in his 20s, when he first ran to the Hobgoblins and how he, how he sort of came to like get this job of being the protector and making sure they don't get out. And where the golf cart always sits in the present day section of the film, there's like a, like a proper car. And the joke, <laughs> the joke is, golf carts were much bigger back then. <laughs> <laughs> I also love that scene because when the hop goblins first arrive in their little like pod, it opens up and it's just these like tiny little hop goblins just staring up at him, like clearly just dolls. And <laughs> I don't know why they're so cute, they're so adorable. Yeah, the the because the the pod itself is just a toy as well. It's like it's a little basket with a lid on it. It's yeah. it's like so small and like pathetic looking. Uh, but yeah, so. We get introduced to our, our cat because the, the new security guard happens to, has him and his group of friends are like, uh, the main characters. Uh, a couple, p- pair of couples, and then the sort of fifth wheel did. Um, we have how many his girlfriend? His girlfriend is annoyed that he's not. Kind of prude. Yeah, she's a prude. She's kind of the worst ever, honestly, because she's always like saying, "Why, why haven't you enjoyed the military like this other guy has? Like, why are you so pathetic? Why do you make no money? Why are you just a security <laughs> guard?" Like, she's constantly just belittling them and. He seems like a nice enough guy. He doesn't seem like he's someone who complains about who he is or what he does. You know, but she just like, oh, I want you to be rich and successful. Why are you not rich and successful? Hurry up and be rich and successful and make me Yeah, proud. you're not a real man. <laughs> not like this other guy whose name I can't remember, but yeah, <laughs> who's like just come back from army. From army, yes. <laughs> and, and for some reason has a uh, like truck or a van full of grenades. Yes, he has a lot, yeah, he has a lot of grenades and guns that he's taken as souvenirs from the army. You know, as if they don't t- t- take a tenery on those. Um, um, which also leads to one of the scenes, because him and his girlfriend, the army guy and his girlfriend, go into the van to have sex. And the, the scene just continues with everyone else having a conversation out in the lawn of this house. And in the background, you just see the van, like, Shaking rocking. back and forth, yes. <laughs> it only lasts about 30 seconds, though, because they get out and their clothes are already on. They're like, oh, well, that was great sex. Back to, back to it. <laughs> Back to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, also around here we get the rake fight where, to prove his manliness, the main security guard did, like goes into a rake fight with the soldier, and you told me this was edited down for the for the for the episode as well. Yeah, it's actually longer. Yeah, that... but it's um, it, yes, and rake fights can sound really dangerous, except. It doesn't matter if there's anything on the end of the sticks because they just hit the sticks together. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> this is like three solid minutes of two two men just hitting sticks together. And when I say hitting sticks, we're talking about the middle of the sticks. It's like it's like, it's like they're making an X yeah, for the sticks. Yeah, handed. Yeah, and then just the middle back and forth like this. Yeah, and it's it just so long. and it goes on for a long ass time. It, it's much longer on the sex scene that we just had in the van. Uh, much, much longer. He's got way more stamina for this, apparently. Um, so, this is supposed to teach him how to fight like a man. <laughs> pick up a rake. Pick up a rake, yeah, and go to town. So, Which is one of my favorite jokes. Because right after that scene, he gets defeated by the soldier, clearly. And his girlfriend's so disappointed and basically yells at him. And he stands up and goes, okay, grab a rake, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that was Tom. I, heard, I think Crow says that. <laughs> Yeah, no, nah, like she she is awful, but it does lead to a lot of humor. Uh, so I, I can't fault it. Uh, I, I say humor, I mean humor from the guys, from the mystery science theater guys, not the movie itself. 
Absolutely, uh, no. The movie itself has no sense of humor. Was I mean, it tries to be funny multiple times and fails spectacularly. Um, so here's the weird thing: is do you think the movie is going to be fun, right? Um, like just on its own, you think it may be fun because once the hobgoblins get out, like, oh, they're going on this tirade. Every time it cuts to like the van and their, their heads are all sticking up and the like the the window of the van, uh, all was really good. Uh, all really funny. The problem is though, is that for some reason, after a couple of attacks by the hobgoblins at this like little apartment they've got, is their their plan is to go to a nightclub because the hob- the hobgoblins have used their powers to make the the prudish girl want to go to the the what I thought was a strip club because the name sounded like a strip club. It sounded club like club scum. Yeah, club scum. It sounded like it was a strip club. It wasn't exactly. Um, although there's a joke no, here. But she does a bit of a strip tease. Oh, she she takes yeah. her gloves off. She, she takes his gloves off and dances around in her like uh, yoga, like outfit. Um, yeah, she's in like a swimsuit. However, like a one piece and a tutu. Yeah, oh, yeah, she's been a tutu like the whole, the whole time. I think. Yeah, you're right. And then the other girl who was with the army guy, there's like a weird running joke here where everyone at the club knows her. Like she comes here all the time. Uh, <laughs> which, which okay, sure. Um, although I did laugh at the bouncer because at one point the, the the waitress is trying to like get them to order drinks. And they're like, we don't want drinks. And so, oh, we're not even 21. And she's like, hey, bouncer dude, get over here. These people aren't 21. I think twi- his name was Road Rash. Ro- yeah, you're right. It was Road Rash. Hey, Road Rash, get over here. These kids aren't even 21. And he com- and you think he's going to come over and throw them out. And he pulls out like just a, like a, a stack of like cards. And he's like, okay, who needs a fake ID? That- <laughs> <laughs> it was clever. Do, do you know what? I'm going to give the movie. That was the movie on its own being a little bit funny. A little yeah. bit. I'll give I'll give them a little bit of credit, a little bit of credit. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is where the movie kind of suffers though, because it spends so long in this nightclub, and then they just go back to the original place they came from and defeat them. There's like a a talent show going on, also where there's there's a band mm-hmm. who's got a hit song. Um, I think it, the hit song is called Kiss Kicker, but there's a <laughs> it's hard to hear them from what they're saying. So uh, for a long time, you think it might be pig liquor. I think the Mike and the bot settle on. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't remember. I remember pig liquor. That's like the funniest one. Yeah. No, pig, pig liquor was good. Pig liquor was good. Um, but I, I think I mean the jokes are still funny from the from the Mystery Science Theater guys. I, I think the the movie itself really like suffers from just staying at this bar for like 40 minutes so it's not maybe not quite that long yeah because the host of this talent show is like unwatchable he's oh, so yeah. bad um <laughs> and eventually chaos breaks out when the hobgoblins are doing stuff but ultimately they, they go back to the the you know where they came from and how is it they defeat them again how is it they, they, they win they're attracted to sound i think or bright lights bright lights bright i think lights. it was yeah um and they, 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 they win. They blew up the building. They blew up the building, that's right. Um, and <laughs> so basically they got permission to blow up a building. They had a building that was uh, going to get demolished anyway. And they're like, hey, can we blow this um, up? I'm not convinced it's not just stock footage. It may just be stock footage. You, you could be right. Um, yeah, the reason why I say that though, because remember the last one we did? Um, had, you know, uh, well, it wasn't, wasn't, I don't know if it was the last one. Mitchell, whenever we did Mitchell. Um mm-hmm. Like, that had so many, like, car chases and stuff in it, and you feel like the entire movie was written around the fact that they knew they could do all this car stuff, because it was like, okay, we'll mm-hmm. just build a plot around And they had a boat. And, and a, a boat, yeah. A helicopter. <laughs> and I feel like this movie, it wouldn't surprise me if it was like, okay, what can we do? Oh, we, we, we happen to know someone who will let us blow up their, their floor and their building. So we're going I to... think that if they really did have that, though, we would get more shots of them inside the wreckage. Okay, that's a fair point. You're right. You're right. Maybe stock footage. I, I don't remember the building looking different, though, which is why... No, it's just like a beige building. Yeah. <laughs> Office building. <laughs> which I guess is why I didn't necessarily think it was stock footage, but you may be right. I mean, it wouldn't shock me if this was stock footage, because it's that type of movie. Like, yeah. you know. They, they don't strike me as people with a budget for pyrotechnics. <gasps> they barely get a budget for their uh, their main alien enemies. The Hobgoblins. The Hobgoblins, yes. Um, apparently Hobgoblins 2 is not as anywhere near as funny uh, to watch. Oh, there's a sequel? There's a sequel, yeah. Uh, which was made after this became popular on Mystery Science Theater. 
Oh, I didn't know that. The director. I know like... they made a, a sequel to Manos cause, for the same reason. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, similar idea. Basically, it became famous because of Mr. Science Theory got cult following. It's like, oh, I'm going to do a sequel now that there's, there's people who will watch it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll do Hobgoblins 2, Electric Boogaloo. Um, <laughs> super fun. Um, the jokes were good, though, uh, in this yeah. one. There's some great like fantasy sequences where like the really super nerdy kid likes, a f- likes calling a phone sex line, except... It's a very bizarre one because the woman on the line who answers and is doing the sexy voice also does the voice of the man. <laughs> it's yeah. very strange. That's but then d- she comes to life and she looks like, I don't know, like... Uh, I don't even think that's the strangest part, like though. Van Halen. <laughs> I, I, I feel like you've glossed over the strangest part of that whole sex line thing is that when we see her like, answer the phone, she's sitting at a really like fancy table and she's wearing like posh clothes. It's like she's like an upper class like businesswoman and she's got uh-huh. like earrings in and she's she looks like like a like a upper middle class woman from like like i don't know some, some 80s movie that has lots of upper middle class people on it i don't know but she, she's not dressed like someone who like like i feel like i mean not that like someone in a sex line has to be dressed this particular way because you can't see them but i feel like i'd expect like to be someone sitting in like a t-shirt just like doing a job because they don't yeah. like it or whatever but she's dressed all proper like she's going out for out for like crumpets afterwards it's she's not wearing her lululemon outfit yeah um but yeah you're right she, she has like both voices it's weird she, she doesn't let him speak for himself she's like oh do you want it daddy and he's like yeah i want it i want it <laughs> <So bizarre. laughs> she does both voices yeah it's weird um, and then she manifests as a as a um sexy woman <laughs> there was air in his quotes. fantasy and she tries to push him over a cliff while he's in a car yes uh he's able to get out of the car but yes um sexy, yeah, you get se- out of the car and be like do you want help pushing it and she goes no get back in the car <laughs> <laughs> yeah this, this is normal uh sex fiend behavior yeah um just gonna push you off the cliff um another running joke i really liked was uh they did this thing with the main dude because he was so derpy that they'd constantly sort of give him like uh Every time he'd stand there reacting to something, they'd just give him these these uh, extra sort of grunting sound effects, which was uh, yeah, matey enjoyable, matey super enjoyable. derpy. Yeah, so that was good. No, it was, yep. it was a... pretty good episode. So I like this one. Yeah. I think this one's season nine, so getting pretty late. Yeah, the end of the run. Yeah, luckily though, we're not going in order, so we literally still have probably over a hundred episodes. So I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, well over. We we got plenty to 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 keep us occupied in Mystery Science Theater for a while, uh, but no, it was a solid episode. Um, I st- I mean, it's fine because I've seen enough now that like it's, when one's really good, it's you not. You have inst- your ranking. It's not instantly in the top three anymore because I, I don't think it is. Because I, I still think Space Mutiny, Mitchell, and um, oh god, what was the one that I really liked? Oh. Time Chasers. Um, time Chase is pretty good. Time Chasers. Werewolf is still at my top. I and like Werewolf's Werewolf. up there, yeah. Yeah. An American Werewolf in traffic. Um, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's so rewatchable. Um, I think that helps. I think if the movie is more, like, you can follow it a little bit better, I think mm. that makes a better episode. Because I, I think Mitchell is pretty good. It's pretty easy to follow. Same with Hobgoblins. It's easy to follow. It just like slows down. Yeah, where's the There's one? There's like four scenes in Hobgoblins that take the entire movie. Yeah, where's the uh, the the overdraw at the memory bank? I really have to think about that title. Um, that <laughs> one was a bit more messy, and I didn't really follow the plot that well. So it was it was less interesting to sit through, um, even mm. though some of the jokes were funny. There's also a comedy, although Hobgoblins is kind of a comedy too. It or at thinks, least it tries to be. Yeah, it's think, it thinks it's a comedy. I mean, it's debatable if it actually uh, pulls it off in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's Mr. Science Theater 3000. That's Hobgoblins. We did it. Uh, which brings an end, more or less, to the show. We do have to tell you what's coming next week um, on, the, on the show. We have The Philadelphia Experiment uh, as the main movie. Uh, something a bit different. Something that neither of us have seen. Not a time mm-hmm. travel film for a time travel uh, season. So... 
yeah, it sounds good. I, I, I've never seen it or heard anyone talk about it before, so we'll see. <laughs> but I don't even know what it is. I, I hope I hope it's a gem. I hope it's a gem. Uh, we could use a win. Me too. We uh, could use one. After Terminator 3 and Fast Color, I think we could use a win. So I agree. And Salvation isn't going to give us it. Ironically, Terminator Salvation will prove to be anything but Salvation. So... Yeah, I am surprised that I'm probably going to rate it higher than Terminator 3. Like, it has to really be terrible for me to go lower. I know, I know. And don't worry, if it doesn't, Genesis has got you covered. <laughs> it's got you covered, baby. Um, yeah, that wasn't very good. So, yeah, things to be excited about. Um, is there anything else to tell you about what's coming up soon that you should know about? Um uh, do check out my top 100 movies list and uh, actually I'll be the time this goes up that we've done the results show already so it doesn't matter <laughs> doesn't matter <laughs> check out check out the top 100 movies as voted for by the male first TV community uh, myself and Tara by the time this goes up we'll probably have already done at least some of the result results for that so mm -hmm. look forward to that um, but yeah that's that's fun uh, so go check out that um, and look forward to other things check out the bonus episode and if you're a patron make sure you vote in this month's patreon vote at the five dollar tier uh, between the four sci-fi movies. Uh, this month's vote that should be up uh, just now, uh, deadline at the end of the month, is of course the video game sci-fi movies, which... <laughs> Not super pumped about those choices. Hey, they can't all be Spielberg. Ah, oh, dear. This is a point in the Tower Make It Fired column, is, is the, the, <laughs> the video game vote. Um, that was all her. So... Look forward uh, to one of those winning, but go vote. Uh, but otherwise, that's us. So thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching sci-fi movies, guys. And computer, that's salsa. Yum, yum.